fans, wherever you may be, welcome back for another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Bill Alpstead, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey Seahawks fans, welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Stead, sitting down again with Keith Myers, here to talk Seahawks football in our midweek show. And um, I think I think we're we're basically just kind of evaluating the team, evaluating the roster, uh, resetting expectations in parentheses again. Um, mm-hmm. Again, we, set, we did <laughs> we that three set. weeks ago. We reset yeah. them. We reset them high and then they promptly lost two winnable games against teams that aren't that good. And now we need to reset them a little lower, but not quite as low as they were originally because they've already surpassed what we originally thought. Um, but they're not quite so, as good as we thought they should be. Yeah. We're not as good as they sh- So I think like you and I both um, thought they were, this was a, a good team and they were going to win a playoff game and, and that kind of stuff. But we thought that after they went on a streak of four straight games where they won all of them by double digits and just in dominant fashion. And we reset our expectations from the five wins that we had before this season to that. And ultimately um, maybe we reset them a little high as they've shown the last couple of weeks, they're still a vulnerable team that uh, is going to lose some games and is not quite as good as we had been led to believe. And it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to pinpoint because the, 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 teams that they played the last two weeks, we were expected to win those games. We were at least even with those teams or better than those teams. Um, and we failed miserably, I thought, in both uh, games, mm-hmm. uh, in the trenches specifically, uh, both in running the ball and in stopping the run. I think that we were you know, abysmal in both games. And it, it kind of points to an area of the team that I think is is fixable, but maybe not currently with the current personnel. It's something that we need to address in the off season. I kind of want to talk about that as far as uh, <clears throat> resetting expectations. I think our original expectations going into the season were this team is not going to be very good. We're going to take the opportunity week in, week out to evaluate players, to yep. find out which players are stepping up, stepping forward, and we can continue and take forward into the future as we rebuild the roster. And and then we started winning, and we were thinking playoffs. Not necessarily that we were going to go, long, you know, deep into the playoffs, but it's a playoff team. It's exciting. We still have that early first round pick uh, from Denver. So while we were winning, they were losing, and we were going to get better, better no matter what. Let's go ahead and enjoy it now while we can. Uh, now we're taking a step back a little bit. I don't think we're necessarily saying. We don't think they they can make the playoffs. I think that they could. They just need to go out and win some games now. The pressure's on uh, for them to do that. The control of their own destiny is now out of their hands. So right now, anyway. Yeah. Over the last over the last three weeks, we've seen the Seahawks go from a game and a half up on San Francisco in the division to being a game behind. Uh, Because the Seahawks have lost twice, had a bye in the middle, and the Forty Niners have won three times during that same strength that same span and uh it's basically i mean the the whole dynamic of the division has changed and uh the seahawks now have to go out they have to beat the 49ers and they have to win probably four of the other five games in order to take the division and that seems like a really tall order given what we've seen the last couple of weeks yeah not ruling it out but i and that's where we're resetting kind of expectations i think it's more now going back um we can we can at least it is for me it's easier for me to take losses and so forth when i'm evaluating the roster mm-hmm. and i think that's where my expectations are now yes we could win but really what we're trying to do here is build a roster that's sustainable probably gives us better chances to win in 2023 2024 so that's kind of my idea of what i'm looking for the rest of the year is finding out which players are stepping up, who can improve between now and the end of the season. Can Gino find that rhythm 
uh, that he had during those four weeks. Again, can we get our running game going? There are certain things that we can do to improve um, as we finish up this season and maybe even get into the playoffs and, and win a game. That would be great. If not, at least we've gone through this process. Um, and so I kind of wanted to just take a look at what areas on the roster currently are we looking at as we go through that process? Which which areas do we need to approve? We know we're going to evaluate and upgrade in the offseason and start to look at those positions. Well, I mean, we mentioned it earlier. They're they're getting beat in the trenches. Um, offense and defensive line are are where this team is getting beat. And I think that that is where this team needs the most improvement. Um, we've seen uh, Seattle draft two uh, offensive tackles that um, look to be the real deal. Um, Lucas has to show that he can continue to play at that level for all four quarters and not run out of gas. In all 17 games, it's hard. You yeah. Know. Um, run, he, but in, in this last game, he just ran out of gas. He was up against Crosby, one of the better pass rushers in the NFL, uh, throughout the entire game. And then, but when it got to the end, uh, he, didn't have anything left. Crosby ran over him twice to end Seattle's last two drives. So uh, he's got to um, work on that. But overall, like as far as like what else we can see, I want to see, I want to see Jake Curran at right, at right guard. Uh, I, you and I have talked about it. It's, this uh, needs it's to happen, it, actually. It needs to happen because we're, we're not getting anything really out of Gabe Jackson at this at the moment. Um, Having uh, Phil Haynes come in, rotate in and out at times it is good because he's been playing a little better, but it hasn't been enough. And we know that Jake Curran is an absolute road grader. And our and that's offense, what the team is lacking right now. Our offense needs that running game going again. And the last two games, you know, they've averaged 1.7 and 1.9 yards per carry. Uh, and they've lost both of them. And that has a lot to do with why. So I think they need to get um, Jake Curran in there. They need to evaluate, is he a guy that they can uh, keep at right guard going into next year, or is this a position where they need to find a new player um, and yes. Yes, go, absolutely. go find an upgrade? So I, they've got, you know, the rest of this, um, these last six games to go figure out what they've got in a guy like Curran. And given that what they've got currently got there isn't working, Making that evaluation now uh, is the, something the team definitely needs to do. And there's there's two ways to, to take a look at this as, as well as, as evaluating the player current right now. In the offseason, um, when it comes time to evaluate our own roster, they could elect to move on from Gabe Jackson and save $6.5 million against the cap next year. Now, we've got a pretty generous cap overall. I think we're ranked sixth in the NFL at $46 million, according to yeah, but they don't Over have a the, lot of players yeah. on contract with that. They've got a lot of money. That's true. Um, but they are lacking. I mean, that's only for like, what is it, 31 players? Um, 31 players currently under contract, correct. Yeah, so. That's um, not unusual. It's I mean, not, it's the, but it's having a lot of cap room when you don't have anybody actually signed. You have to you have to fill those roster spots. Including the quarterback those spots. position, which is critical. Yeah, and so I think that they're in a situation where saving some cap room, getting some other guys um, under contract, that kind of stuff needs to happen. Gabe Jackson has been, he was great last year, but he's been a massive disappointment this year. And moving on, saving that $6.5 million, getting younger and better at that position is key because you look at both these last two games, the interior of the offensive line has been the biggest weakness on this roster. And, you know, Jackson's part of that. He, him and him and Blythe in the middle um, just aren't getting the job done. And so let me, need to replace <clears throat> let me tell you a, a few things that are available. So I went out and looked at the free agency um, in, in these different positions that we're going to talk about today. Uh, Jack Coughlin's uh, out there, Connor McGovern, both are having mediocre seasons. Nate Davis from Tennessee is another player that's um, that looks pretty good. Uh, Dalton Risner from Denver. Isaac. Uh, Sia Molo from the Eagles, 29 years old. I think he's the best free agent guard available out there. Uh, he would be a guy that I would like to see as well if you're talking about spending money on, at that position. I don't know that it's necessarily a good idea to spend money at a right guard position uh, when you can go and probably get a decent one in the draft and have, have a guy come in right away. 
and uh, start. But you're also probably looking at center as well. We mm -hmm. know uh, Austin Blythe is not the long-term answer there. He's the lowest graded um, lineman on the team uh, other than Gabe Jackson. And I would imagine the team will probably try to upgrade that position as well. Um, but whether or not they do it in free agency or the draft is, is the question. Uh, the nice thing about the draft, for those of you that do not know, Seattle has Denver's first and second round picks as well, and Denver's losing like crazy. Currently, the fourth pick overall in the draft, which is pretty interesting. You know, you've got players like Jalen Carter, who's a complete game wrecker, quarterback C.J. Stroud, Edge Will Anderson, Miles Murphy, a corner like uh, Keely Ringo or another quarterback, and Will uh, Levis could all be available at that pick. Uh, so it prevent, presents some interesting options for Seattle um, at positions of need. And so it'll be interesting to see, even if they were to retain a guy like Geno Smith, and we've seen the kind of up and down scenario that Geno has now. Granted, his completion percentage is high and his quarterback rating is pretty decent. He's somehow been able to avoid throwing interceptions, even though he's had interceptable balls thrown. Um, but we've seen it kind of sputter a little bit with him. And <clears throat> I know that He's playing well enough where I think we could get by, but are we a Super Bowl team with Geno at quarterback? And that's the, the question that needs to be asked when we go into the draft next year. you got a guy like C.J. Straub there. And there's a potential, too, where you've got a scenario where Will Anderson and Jalen Carter and Miles Murphy, all those defensive guys, defensive ends, defensive tackle guys are off the board, one, two, three. And you got a guy like C.J. Straub sitting there or um, – Bryce Young or Will Levis, one of those quarterbacks is there, and you really don't have anybody else of value there that you want to take, and you can't trade out the pick, they're going to pick C.J. Stroud um, because mm -hmm. you just can't pass on like a talent like that at that point in the draft. Well, the, and the other uh, situation is that Stroud, Stroud goes one, Young goes two, Levis goes three, and Seattle's sitting there at four with pretty much every non-quarterback in the draft uh, available to them. And you know, what do you want? Because if, if you, whatever you want, it's there, it's available. Um, you know, Will Anderson, Jalen Carter, uh, defensive lineman, and you're going to fix a lot of problems if you can Absolutely. get one of those guys in there. Absolutely. And we talked, we haven't talked yet about, you know, issues on our defensive line, but those are it. Defensive mm -hmm. tackle, nose tackle, uh, probably another at stud edge guy in the draft, what certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, and, and linebacker and maybe safety. Uh, on the defensive side, on the offensive side, you mentioned guard. We talked about center. You take a look at it, running back number two, uh, wide receiver number three, and mm -hmm. then quarterback. You know, let's talk about the quarterback situation. We have Geno, but he's not under contract. He's going to be expensive this year, at least semi-expensive, probably north of somewhere between $27, $28 million and $35 million. And, I, think, um, I think it'll be closer <laughs> to 20 but... Uh, 2022, somewhere in that range, but still, you're still talking about a huge, uh, huge chunk of the available cap to get a quarterback. Uh, and Do you think that his numbers gone down just in the last two weeks? Is because I, a couple three weeks ago we were talking maybe 30, 32, 31 as the uh, the franchise tag that's exclusive. Yeah, and but he won't get the exclusive tag. Or not exclusive. I'm sorry. Um, he'll yeah he'll get the non exclusive tag, and it'll be. Which is if he if they have to he'll be in that range. But honestly, I, I think it's not just that it's gone down. I I don't think it was ever that high unless they had to, unless they got in. It seemed like they're they competing had. against themselves. But when you go look at the free agent market and the quarterback market, he's one of three prospects that are at the top. And when you get into that sort of a club, somebody's just going to overpay. Mm -hmm. It just is the way the NFL works sometimes. Yeah, there's just no there. Free agent quarterbacks just aren't a thing. Um, and it's, it's so rare that one's available that that isn't terrible. I mean, you got and, Brady, Brisket, uh, Brissett, uh, Flacco, Garoppolo, Henneke, uh, Jackson, who's going to be 10 or, uh, have the franchise, franchise. tag put on and then, um, and shoot. That's it. Yeah. I mean, and you're looking at, at Garoppolo being, being the only guy Winning that you quarterback could go on that list. Yeah. He's the only guy that you could go win games with, uh, on that list other than Gino. So it's never a good list. And I, I still think you go, you go look at these last two games and, you know, Gino still played pretty well. The problem was much more the lack of a running game. 
because without the running game, it really just limited the offense as far as what they were able to do. There was a lot of more third and longs, uh, a lot less play action, um, and it became a problem. They need to get that run game going again. And if they do, you're going to see Gino continue, you know, go back to being um, a guy that's that's leading a really effective offense. I mean, look at how many points the offense scored in this game. And uh, that was in a game in which they had no running game whatsoever. And they were so the a offense, total of 65 yards and they, then they put most, up 34 points. Yeah. And so this is a, this is a, um, this is a, um, an offense that's still putting up points with no running game. And a lot of that, you got to give a lot of that credit to, to Gino and his ability to get the ball to, uh, open receivers and, um, you know, complete a high percentage of balls and that kind of stuff. So I think that he's a guy that you need to retain, but at the same time, you know, that decision is going to be made in February and the draft doesn't happen until April. And so if you make that decision and you sign Gino and then you're sitting there at the, with the fourth pick, uh, thanks to Denver and CJ Stroud is sitting there, what do you do? That's why I think if you're Seattle, <clears throat> you've got to figure out this this free agency number with with Gino. It's just, this is going to be a pretty important off season. Probably one of the most consequential off seasons Seattle's had for a while. I mean, you take a look at last year; everything is consequential when you're kind of win now mode. But that decision with Gino could hamper the ability of this franchise to kind of move forward with its future if they're not careful. Um, I would predict a one to two year deal, but Gino may hold out. They may have a market out there for him. He might get a three-year deal. Plus, I don't think so, but it's it's possible. They may have to let him walk. It's just one of those deals. Um, I don't know that they they would, but it's possible, especially if they think Stroud or Levis, you know, and they like one of those two guys to be available in the draft. They may just decide to reboot this thing, knowing that they're going to put a really good roster around those guys. I don't know. Well, and you also end up in a situation where uh, maybe they, they can't get a deal done with Chino, so they put the franchise tag on him, knowing that they can then trade him. And that there's going to be a team like maybe Tampa um, with Brady retiring that that needs a quarterback, and they don't want to go through. Uh, you know, they won too many games to get a quarterback in this draft, and they don't want to go through a whole rebuild. They just want to get a guy, and you can trade him uh, down, to, down to Tampa or, or um, to the Colts or whoever that needs a quarterback and go get some assets uh, for him and still go out and get your quarterback. I mean, I don't think that the Seahawks are a team that's, that's against running a rookie quarterback out there with a, a, a Super Bowl ready roster. If they think they've got one because they did in 2012, they ran Russell Wilson out there uh, even though the rest of the roster looked ready to compete. And for the first yeah. six weeks, it was it was downright ugly. But then Wilson, you know, did what he did and and really turned it around and and became yeah. uh, became the guy we we knew he was. So uh, it's a. I, I think you're we're in a situation where I I wouldn't just say, oh, you have to go with a vet, um, because they'll they'll set up an offense that they can win with a rookie, and uh, whether it's Stroud or Young or Levis or whoever. Uh, if they need to, they can go win with that. Interesting. All right. Other positions of need. I mentioned wide receiver number three, running back number two. Um, what do you think about those? Uh, definitely. And I think you look in this draft when you have two first round picks, two second round picks, and the way the draft falls, and 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 it's kind of top heavy with wide receivers. And so in one of those four picks, you're there's going to be a, a wide receiver sitting there that is not right. a number three. He's a number one or a number two. And you're yeah. going to be like, so what's the downside here? And I, I think that you're going to end up seeing them take, take that. If you look at our, our mocks from last week, like I ended up getting mm -hmm. uh, a really nice wide receiver with that second first round pick because I was expecting him to go top 10 and he didn't. So, um, you know, that, that's the kind of situation there. I, I obviously, um, you know, Goodwin's been okay. He's he's made some plays. He's struggled a little bit at times, but he's also made some plays. Uh, but they're getting nothing out of uh, the second round pick from a year ago, and that's unfortunate um, because 
they yeah. really they Dwayne really Eskridge we're talking about yeah they really expected Eskridge to come in and uh win that number three job you know be kind of a weapon that they can do different things with and he he just has not taken advantage of it he's now hurt and on um on injured reserve uh he's going to be out most of the rest of the season he might come back for the last week or two if they're in the in a playoff push uh but he's he hasn't helped them so far it's unlikely that he would help them down the stretch yeah he's been an extreme disappointment this year and at some point, you know, this team needs to find a legit number three. And I'm sorry, but he's just not it. Um, yeah, and there's lots to choose from in the draft. You know, I'm not so much in free agency. If you look at free agency, you know, uh, Aguilar is out there, DJ Shark, uh, Smith Schuster. That's about it. That list is pretty shallow as, as, as mm-hmm. wide receivers go. But in the draft, when you talk about five picks in the top 80 currently, um, you know, we've got some options out there. So it'll be really interesting to see if they use one of those on a wide receiver. Um, there are so many positions on defense. It's easy when you do a mock draft and you go out there mock draft sites. It's so easy to pick five defensive players in a row because we have those holes to fill. We've got a defensive mm-hmm. tackle, def- nose tackle, edge, uh, linebacker, safety, either a strong safety or a second free safety for all positions of need, at least on my list. Um, And depending on the way the draft falls, best players available out there could definitely be on the defensive side. I think when you take a look at the draft overall, I'm starting to get the feeling that this is a defensive draft. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a a defense heavy (laughs) draft in terms of the talent is what it appears to be. And it's a defensive heavy draft for Seattle in terms of need. So I think that it's a good fit. um, Agreed. To pick Seattle to get a bunch of defensive players because honestly they kind of need it. I mean, um uh, Shelby Harris, Quentin Jefferson, those guys are like rentals. Mm-hmm. They're they're older players, you know, nearing the end of their career that And they've got uh, cap numbers that are uh, have the ability to kind of turn those things over. Uh Shelby mm-hmm. Harris, you could save 9 million dollars against the cap by moving on or restructuring Shelby Harris. They do that. That's 9 million dollars, especially if they need to, you know, come up with money to pay Geno Smith. Gabe Jackson sitting out there. We already talked about that 6.5. Quandre Diggs. It's a $10 million savings if he's cut. It's more if it's a post-June 1st. Uh, Nuasu, $8 million sitting out there. Now, we want a player like Nuasu, but if they went and extended him um, further yeah, they down, could, down the road, they could save some of that. They could give give him an extension and actually lower his cap uh, number for next year. Right. And... Um, but so there's, there's, there's not, there, my point is there's an opportunity there to create some more cap space too. If we find players in free agency that were are attractive to the team, they don't want to they want to get these things solved before the draft. They can go out and do some of that. But with with those high draft picks, Seattle knows that they're going to get three or four impact players out of the draft. So that's going to really impact the way that they view free agency. So it'll be very interesting to see how they spend their money. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is frustrating, though, is that if you look at the free agents that are out there, and you've kind of been um, doing this as you go through, there's not a lot of good players at the positions that were Seattle needs. There's players, yeah. but it's not the it's not the guys that um, you know the Seahawks need. Um, there's a, there's a couple of things. I mean, I haven't talked about defense too much, but like at, at nose tackle, where you need to run stuff or. Dalvin Tomlinson sitting out there, uh, 29 years old. Ashawn Robinson with the Rams right now, 330 pounds, 20 years old, run stuff or something like that would be good. On the nose tackle side, Javon Hargrave, a guy that's been sitting out there. You and I both loved him since he was at Pittsburgh. Uh, runs a 4'9", 340 at 305 pounds. He's an interior pass guy. Matt uh, Lewanditis from the Panthers, 6'3", 205. It's kind of a lower cost disruptor. Uh, there's a few more. Uh, the guy from the Saints, I can't remember his name. Uh, Deron Payne from the Commanders, 363, to 320 pounds, runs a 495. Um, seven sacks, 33 pressures in 2022. He's a free agent. Now they may tag him, but if he's out there and available, I would imagine a player like that is very attractive to Seattle. Although I will say this with all those young, really good defensive players in the draft, especially with that top pick. Seattle may hold off on paying some of these guys and just 
I don't know, spreading, spreading it out so much and not paying a guy like Duran Payne, who's going to, you know, have like a four year, $75 million deal. Uh, that's just going to be kind of crazy for them. Yeah. And it, that, that's, I don't think they'll, they'll do that. I mean, that's not the way the Seahawks have done stuff. Um, although Duran Payne would be an interesting uh, addition, but I'm, you also look at, at a guy that's, um, that's, you didn't list, but maybe should, and that would be Puna Ford. Mm-hmm. He is definitely uh, a free agent. And he is, yeah. So he's a free agent and he's going to need to be re-signed. So mm-hmm. um, are you going to go out I don't know and, that they're happy with the way that, what they've gotten out of Puna, but you know, every time you, uh, you watch a game, he makes an impact play. He's in there for a sack. He's, he's kind of a hustle guy. Um, but can it, can the team upgrade that, especially now where they're in a position to do it? Um, they've got some money. They've got the draft picks. Do they upgrade that spot? Yeah. I mean, honestly, um, it depends on the, on the cost. If they can bring him back at a reasonable cost, I think you'd do it. Uh, because you need Last a rotation on your like defensive thing. Eleven and a half million dollar a deal, uh, a year deal. Yeah, I mean, would you take him back for that? Probably, yeah. That's that's a that's a reasonable deal for a, um, you know, starting caliber defensive tackle. Does he fit the scheme? Yeah, I think he does. I think he is um, one of the guys that kind of based the scheme around, and uh, it was. Quentin Jefferson and Shelby Harris that just didn't couldn't do the two gap thing and needed to um, needed to to be a penetrator of one gap in order to be successful and that's why they had to make that switch. I think he's a, he's he's not as long as they prefer there, nor as stout, and so I think they they'd love to try to figure out a way to get us you know six four eighty three inch wingspan guy in there, but that's just me. What about, um, what about bringing back a? Um, a guy like Rasheem Green. Interesting. Yeah, um, or Charles Amenahu or somebody somebody like yeah. that. Yeah. You also got LJ Collier who's going to be a free mm-hmm. agent. Uh mm-hmm. so I mean, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts, obviously, and it's like that every year, but you've got this is a team that's got a lot of decisions to make. And I they need to figure out what they've got and what they want to do. And I right. think that you look at the season and just, you know, blindly chasing wins and not evaluating your roster. Um, given that they're six and five now, they're on the outside looking in. They've got a long way to go to just to get back into the playoffs. Um, you need to make sure that you're you're doing uh, both, right? Yeah, you can chase wins, but you've also got to evaluate your roster and you got to make sure that you are ready for this off season because it's an important off season. Where are you at with Cody Barton? Uh, I'm. I like Cody Barton as a special teams player and a third middle linebacker, a guy that can rotate in and, and, you know, cover you in case of an injury. But I think he's shown he's not, a, he's not quite starting caliber. I mean, he's good in coverage, but as a run defender and some of the other things that you asked a middle linebacker to do, he just hasn't, he just hasn't been good enough. And I think getting a guy beside uh, Brooks that can really play and, uh, is that a position that you go out and you spend money on, or do you pick somebody up in the draft that you've I think you got pick to bring up along a little bit? I think you pick up someone in the draft. Although when you got a guy like Rokon Smith, who's going to be a free agent, uh, who, who, who's 20, 26. I don't know. The Ravens they gave up for, picks though to get him. Yeah, but they gave up picks to get him. But they've got other things going on, including their quarterback. Mm-hmm. And if they if they end up having to to tag. Um, you know, Jackson, you know, a guy like Smith is going to be available. And if they can go get him, you go get him. Well, yes. You're going to eventually pay Brooks. Then you'd be paying Roquan Smith. And Smith's going to probably set the market at like $18 million. So where do you spend your money in free agency if, if you're Keith Myers and you're the gen- general manager, Keith? Well, the problem that I have is like where I want to spend the money, I'm not seeing players that I want to spend money on. Where do you want to? Like, I've got this pretty good, pretty well researched. Where do you want to spend money? I want to get a uh, a guy, um, center or right guard that mm-hmm. I can I can bring in, and I go through and I look at those positions, 
And I honestly just don't see a guy that I want to spend money on, even yeah. though, even though th- in, in terms of like, you know, philosophically, I think they need to, s- to spend money and make, take this weakness and turn it into a strength. Find me the player, unless there's a cap casualty that happens yeah, along the way of a the, good the, player. The, I don't the see The guard it. from the Eagles, uh, Siu Malo, um, 29 years old, best offensive guard out there on the market. He would be a guy. Nate Davis would be another guy. Tennessee, he's used to blocking for Henry. Um, so that would be another guy. Coughlin and, and McGovern are have the name recognition, but their play has been less than for a couple mm-hmm. of years now. And so I wouldn't go out and spend big money on those guys if they're available um, for, you know, one or two year deals at the end of free agency, then yes. Um, but but the guy from the Eagles, I think, is a name to watch for yeah. Seattle. So between like that and then, um, you know. And the only free to... agent center out there is Garrett uh, Bradbury out of Minnesota. He's allowed two sacks on 731 snaps this year. But last well, year I... and the year before, he was pretty low as far as his overall grade i've got connor mcgovern as a center um he can play center it, yeah um but again he's 30 and you know there's better there are better players out there mm-hmm. um so between you know defensive tackle and and uh guard or, or center like mm-hmm. those are that's that's where i'm looking if i want to spend money and i Again, I'm not seeing right. guys that I want to go drop a bunch of money on. And you've got the free agency money and you want to spend it, uh, you know, to make your team better. And so, okay, let's let's get it set up so that way you can draft those positions. Okay, well, that means you're going to spend money on uh, on other positions. So go. Right. Go sign a well, guy. They've got like some, yeah, they've got some edge players out there. Devin Bush. Yeah. I mean, you could spend money on a linebacker. You could spend money on an edge, which is an outside linebacker in our system. Zach Allen's going to be out there. Uh, Lorenzo Carter. Marcus Davenport from the Saints, uh, who's been a name. Uh, one, he was drafted 14th overall in the 2018 draft. He's only got one sack this year and 27 pressures. Maybe he's available in a, a little bit of a discount. Justin Houston. Um, is out there. He's got 10 sacks, 26 pressures in 2022. Dermot Jones from Denver. Yannick is out there still. He's got 11 sacks. Charles Aminoyou, who we really liked in the draft a few years back with the 49ers. He's coming up available. He's more of a five tech though. JJ Watt from the Cardinals. While he's been injured quite a bit, yeah, he still has 42 injured. pressures and seven sacks in 2022. Um, yeah. And he's not going to be nearly as expensive as he has been in the past. So, and, and as far as linebackers are concerned, Levante David's out there, Jermaine Edmonds from the Bills, TJ Edwards from the Eagles, Rashawn Evans from the Falcons. All those guys are, are really decent. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's some options, but Seattle needs to figure out if they're going to be players. You mentioned earlier, we've only got 31 players under contract. We're going to have to sign our own guys. Every year you hear John Snyder and Pete Carroll say, hey, our priority is going to be to sign our own players. And that's, I think, what they end up doing for the most part. So I would think based on the, the knowledge they have with their draft capital, I think they go into free agency fairly conservative. And I think that, um, you know, they addressed one position where mm-hmm. they go out and spend money and then everything else is kind of filler. And that's kind of the way I'm thinking, but I don't know what that position would be. And, th- and that could include paying Geno Smith. I don't know. Um, yeah. If you if I'm going to go and spend on one position, um, just looking at the roster the way it is and the way the draft is where you, and where you have those picks, I'm going to go get an interior offensive lineman because I know that you can get Jalen Carter uh, with that fourth or fifth pick, whatever mm-hmm. it ends up being from Denver, mm-hmm. that will fix a lot of your defensive line problems uh, as yeah. just an absolute game wrecker in the middle. And, you know, you can get a, you know, 330 pound nose tackle in, um, you know, in, in the third round that will come in and make That's an true. impact. And so I'm looking at that and I, I'm, I'm looking more towards the uh, offensive line because when you look at offensive linemen that you, that you would normally take at the top of the draft, those are all offensive tackles and Seattle doesn't need that. They need interior guys. Those are guys that are usually taken, mm-hmm. um, you know, round two, round three. And 
This yeah. isn't a great draft. This isn't a great draft for interior, interior guys. line. Interior line guys. The 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 biggest name that's out there right now that's first come off the board would be Osiris Torrance. Um, and then it's just it's just not. There's just not a lot. You go you know clear down into the 80th pick overall, and you got a guy like Andrew Voorhees, the interior offensive lineman center from the Trojans. Um, Jarrett Patterson, the lighter weight um, center out of um, Notre Dame. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it. See, yeah, that's what I mean. Like this, Ricky Stromberg, not, maybe you know, Kentucky center. This isn't the best draft for interior offensive linemen. So it is if, not. If one's available in free agency, I think you go get one. And then you make sure that you use your draft capital on the defense because um, yeah. that's where you the strength of the draft the same is. Way. You and I see it the same way. Yeah. yeah. And there's plenty of running backs. So, for example, if Seattle wants to um, get in the running back game in free agency, if they're, they're patient, Barkley's out there, Damian Harris, Hunt, Josh Jacobs, Rashad Penny, Tony Pollard, Jamal Williams from Detroit had a great game against us. Mm -hmm. uh, he's out there. So, there's some options out there for running back number two um, without having to spend a ton of money. Um, so that would be something maybe you could do in free agency as well, uh, because in the draft you've got running backs as well, but it's not quite as stacked after like pick yeah, after the fourth round. It's just kind yeah. of non-existent. I'd be willing to bet that we see Rashad Penny back on a near veteran minimum deal. Me too, because I don't think he's he's a viable option for any other team. He just had too yeah. many injuries. Mm -hmm. Too many injuries, not enough production, and but Seattle knows what he what he is, what he's got, and they're not going to ask him to come in and, and carry the load like they did this year. Right, they're going to ask him to come in and, and be a backup. You've got a better roster though next year with higher expectations, and then you're depending on a guy like Penny to be your running back number two. I don't know about that. You know, you've got Dallas there that's on one more year, but that is that enough? Is that enough of a running back room where you're going to go into a season with? I'm just not sure. I think so. Um, because you've got Walker that's going to carry the load. You, you have a guy like Penny who's always hurt, but if he's not being expected to carry the load and he's going to, you're going to give him five carries, five touches a game uh, on average, like he can withstand that. He can play that. And um, I think he can add something to your team for next to nothing. And he knows the offense. He knows the system. Like, or you could draft Jack, Zach Charbonnet in the fourth round, and um, that would solve your problem. You could do well. both. <laughs> you could do both. Um, all right. So let's get back and close this thing out. What is your? We've talked about resetting expectations now. Um, about evaluating our own roster. About what the reality is on the ground with this team this year. Where are we at? I, I think we're looking at a team that's like an, you know, an eight, maybe a nine win team, probably an eight win team. Uh, and okay, that's okay. You know, it's going to um, show that they are much better than anyone thought uh, coming in where people were, like you and I said five, national media was saying two. Um, it, you know, for them to get to eight, that's um, that's a great year considering they've developed um woolen and the tackle yeah. yes, and yes, you know yes, that right. kind of stuff yes. so yes I, I like what we're what we're seeing uh from the from the young players and so yeah go out have another draft and reset come in next year as this really young hungry team and that was already you know an eight or nine game winner and now you've just upgraded the roster you've gotten younger you've gotten hungrier um, for a team that was already in eight or, eight or nine games. And so now you're looking at 11, um, so 12, me, and yeah. Talk to me just a, for a little bit on how you now look at this Russell Wilson trade. Oh, I love the Russell Wilson trade at this point because Wilson's looked terrible. And I know some of that's the offense and, and the coaching staff there has been kind of trash uh, and all that. But Wilson's not, he's not doing himself any favors either. He's looked genuinely kind of bad in some of these games. I mean, there's a reason why his own teammates were yelling at him up the sideline. And so for the Seahawks to go and get, you know, the two draft picks that they had, one of which became Charles Cross, um, one of which became Boye Mafe, two good picks, and then 
have these these next two picks where they're both going to be um right now they're four and 16. yeah so that i mean i mean but he, four and 34. yeah um and so you're looking at at you know in the first couple of picks in round or your know, fourth pick overall in the first couple of picks around two um you're looking at a couple of starters including a, a superstar maybe a, with a fourth overall pick uh to do that and realize that this offense works even with a Geno Smith at quarterback. Uh, although Geno Smith is over, you know, like he's way, been way better than we expected. Um, but you can, you don't need Russell Wilson at quarterback to make this offense work. And so for them to get all of, all of that and just reset the franchise. Yeah. It, I'm sorry, but. Gino has outplayed Russ this year. So the Seahawks got the better quarterback out of out of the two of them and two firsts and two seconds. Plus t- two players that have an impact. Yeah. So and, al- and that allowed us to make other moves in the draft as well with those mm-hmm. other picks. I mean, it just has to be viewed as a whole, I think. Yeah, yeah I, don't, and, it, I don't think we end up with Abe Lucas without uh, the draft because I think they're reaching for an offensive tackle um, with their first pick, you know, in round two. And rather than, um, you know, letting the draft come to them, being able to, to take Lucas in round three because yeah, they've already got other either. picks. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's a, the, it's a situation that works. Like is, it worked out really well. If you well view for this from Denver's point of view, is this the worst trade of all time? Um, it's quite possibly their worst trade of all time because not only are, did they give up all of that for a, a, in a situation that's not working out, they also signed him to a massive deal with yeah. tons of guarantees. $126 they, million dollars guaranteed. They are on the hook for Russell Wilson. And, $84 and he's, million dollars this year, $68 million next year. Yeah. And they're, they can't move on. They can't, you know, flush this and move on. They, they can they, they have can to, they can move on with a post June first cut designation, but they're out sixty eight million dollars. They're out sixty eight million dollars, which means they they can't move on. Right. Um. They they're gonna have to. It'll handicap them for. for they're gonna have to ride this out for two or three years and hope that he returns back to the guy he is was. Their, is their best their option? Experience. Is their best option to trade for Pete Carroll so that Pete Carroll can <laughs> create? <laughs> An offense for them that's structured around Russell Wilson. Uh, maybe. Um, I think what what you're gonna see though is you're gonna see um that entire coaching staff, you know, um, canned here very, very shortly, uh, and then they're gonna they're gonna bring in uh, a coaching staff that will get more out of Russ. I, and, I agree, and I totally um, agree. But this probably, season's gone. Probably bring in, um, you know, a guy like Brian Schottenheimer as the offensive coordinator to make sure that, uh, because some of Russ's best years. I'm laughing. But, there. but you're you're spot on. You, I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, that's really the only choice that they have is to bring in somebody that Russ is familiar with and can succeed with to create mm-hmm. an offense around him that protects him as a player. So you look at. And I'm not talking about line protection. I'm talking about deficiencies. So you look at uh, his, um, you know, that, that team and the, the defense has underperformed a little bit, but the offense has made it so hard on them that it doesn't really matter that much. No, the um, defensive players are yelling at Russ on the sidelines. So. Yeah. So you bring in a defensive head coach and um, a guy like Schottenheimer to run the offense. Mm-hmm. And so now, that they've, and they've talked about. Thing keeping the defensive coordinator that they they had because um, he's shown himself to be pretty decent. And, of course, they have a, a number one defense, and they would be clearly number one if they had an offense to mm-hmm. keep them on the field. Um, that would be interesting. Anyway, we're getting off track here. So good show. Uh, we kind of got sideways a little bit as far as the expectation portion of the show, but – I kind of wanted to have that conversation about the way this thing plays out now. It's like, is winning the most important thing now or is evaluating 
Um, and I think evaluating was always the, the, the biggest thing out of this year because it was unrealistic at the beginning. I think it's still unrealistic to expect this team to do anything in the playoffs if they were to get there. I'm not ruling out that they will, uh, but if they do, it's going to be a hard road. Um, I, I don't think sure I, set up really well I don't think that you have to on. I don't think you have to shut people down and um go full into evaluate the young player mode. That needs to be part of what you're doing. Um, Agreed. But you also need to go you can you have the opportunity to make playoffs, go in some games. I think you can do both at the same time. I think you can um get Curhan in there at right guard and evaluate him while trying to win games because you know he can help you jumpstart the running game. You can bring a guy like Miles Adams in and give him more playing time on uh, the defensive line if you think he might be a uh, a guy that can develop and see if what you can if you can get anything from the, out of that or maybe he's not the guy and maybe you um, he has a hard on. time stopping the run. We know that. Yeah, so maybe you bring someone off the practice squad to fill that rotational spot. Um, but do things that will do both, that will help you win and also um, give you an opportunity to look at players for next year. Yeah, and Seattle's done really well with that. I mean, look at all of our rookies. I mean, that's the great part about this season is we have all the rookies starting, all that's experience next year. It's just going to be... Uh, an amazing opportunity for this team to to really jump because oh, yeah. of those draft picks and, and you get one free agent that just pops and and those five picks in the top 80 currently right now um can reset this entire franchise for years to come if they hit this thing um, yeah so it'll it, be exciting it, it's like um you know 2011 2012 again with all those young players and all that um, those guys that have a, have the potential to be here for a long time and make a huge impact, uh, they're in a position to, to really load this roster up. Um, all right, let's get out of here. Find Keith on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter. The show's on Twitter, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Find us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube. Hit that subscribe button and share it. So until next time, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Phil is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.